Okay, so um, I will share with you uh, on some of our work here on the amended area of vehicle and also uh, ground robotic. Now, as you know that um, the robotic driven by technology development and also by application need, and they're helping many uh, emerging applications in various area, uh, including the environmental cleaning, uh, warehouse logistics, search and rescue, transport, and so far, so forth. And, uh, and you can see all those applications here, they have a different environment and different requirement and so on, right? So um, what I like to talk today is uh, we will I'll give you some uh, introduction to the perception and localization. And then I will focus on uh, multi-modality sensor fusions, uh, some of the work we have done and uh, some more technology we have developed uh, will be given. And then we will talk about some application in the uh, structure inspections with John and also talk about the logistic, uh, robotic in the logistic and also the docking applications. And lastly, I will talk about some future research direction. Now, um, let me briefly give you some intro about the perception. Now, perception essentially is to uh, detect, uh, understand and interpret the environment using sensors, just like our human being, we use our eye and ear and so on, right? To sense our environment and to know where we are and then to plan our path to go a certain location. Now, uh, the same for robotic here. Robotic, it will use different kinds of sensor, for example, the camera, uh, leader, radar, and also some of the uh, anchor-based uh, localization system here to, to sense, to localize itself. And we know the sensor, different sensor, of course, have different uh, competitive advantage and limitation. For example, the camera, um, we can have very dense pixel level of the information and also is uh, very low cost, widely available, but then there's a limitation uh, on the depth, you know, because the camera typically we don't have accurate depth and also the, the uh, distance is very limited. And for LiDAR, of course, it has been widely used and uh, LiDAR can have a very accurate uh, ranging information um, or not affected by the lighting condition and so on. But then it also in the extreme weather condition, for example, the heavy rain, uh, we will have the LiDAR performance or distance will be degraded. And of course, LiDAR also have uh, some resolution uh, issues. And so that, uh, you know, you may not be able to see some object in the complete picture so that from the geometric point of view. And for LiDAR, of course, the resolution is not very high and so on. So each of the sensor, they have the advantage and the limitations. And in the, Robotic system here, typically we need to select a suitable set of the sensor and so that we can uh, use the sensor here, collect the information and then do some processing. Now processing of sensor data, of course, we will need to have uh, some sensor model and also understand the, what kind of the feature available in the environment and the distribution, right? So that we can use those type information to uh, better, um, sense for that environment and localize cell. So uh, localization, of course, is essentially you want to estimate the location of the robot uh, with respect to the world coordinate, right? And uh, then uh, mapping wise is uh, to build the, the map of the surrounding environment and use the map here to, for, to check the robot. And beyond, beside the uh, perception and localization, uh, we also have planning and control, right? Once you know the, the environment, in this case, you know where you are and uh, you know where you want to go, then we could uh, plan our paths and so that, uh, you know, the low level control can take over to check the, the path you have planned to achieve um, the checking of the path to reach the destination. Yes. Okay, so this basically is the perception and uh, I think you know, those of you working in the robotic, you have, uh, you know, you know this pretty well. And in terms of the perception system, we know our GPS still uh, is widely used. And in the early year, we also use radar, for example, in the civilian and uh, military application to detect 
the object and so on. Um, in the 1990s year, uh, we uh, so-called the ultrasound, 2D ultrasound. And of course, ultrasound can be accurate, but then the limitation is that, that the range is very limited. Then we have, uh, you know, the 2D LiDAR, which is still widely used. And this can provide very accurate ranging to the uh, object in the environment. And uh, also we have, uh, you know, the camera, which as I say, just now we have, uh, we can have very rich information about the environment using the camera. Now, um, recent, year, recent year, we have seen the 3D LiDAR, uh, which have been used in the perception and localization and 3D LiDAR he, um, provided a much richer information about the environment can achieve much accurate uh, positioning. And uh, so uh, 3D LiDAR, of course, we know uh, you have mechanical type and uh, recently we also have a MEM, you know, solid state MEM uh, type here. Okay, the, but of course the 3D LiDAR that uh, the disadvantage here is uh, the cost for the mechanical 3D LiDAR is still very expensive. Uh, but moving forward here, when we see more and more um, MEM-based uh, 3D LiDAR uh, available in the market here, we will see that the price will go down. And in, in addition to those sensors here, and we also have some uh, uh, beacon-based localization using the uh, so-called RF signal, for example, use the uh, Wi-Fi, use the also wide bank or use uh, RFID and so on right, to do localization. And because of the limitation of each of the sensor, um, recent years, a lot of study have been focused on, you know, the um, multi-modality sensing. That means to combine the advantage, competitive advantage of different uh, sensor, and also to achieve the more reliable and robust and have a more redundancy in our sensing and localization system. Now, let, let me just to, uh, talk a little bit about the, you know, the method for the uh, localization. Now we have two approach. One is so-called traditional pipeline, right? Uh, which is very material and accurate. So in sensory is you use the sensor here and uh, to uh, science the environment, then you abstract the feature from the environment. Yeah. With, for example, some of the corner uh, of the building or edge, some uh, plank and so on, right? You abstract the feature. And then uh, you, you do feature matching, right? When you look up, uh, move another position here, you do uh, feature matching to associate the feature with what you obtained previously, right? Then you use the information um, to estimate the translation and rotation of the robot. So this will come to so-called motion estimation. Right? So you, the sensor could be 2D and the map here could be 2D. And uh, of course it also have 2D to 3D and 3D to 3D, right? So, so you have at uh, least use a various pipeline to achieve the localization. And for this uh, pipeline approach here, um, it's accurate and uh, mature, but uh, it's disadvantage here is uh, not easy to implement. You must have a very good understanding on the various the module of the, this pipeline here. And also the application is very much uh, scenario uh, dependent. So that's why that's the difficult of the robotic because we really uh, do not have uh, one size fit all solutions. And for different application, different uh, environment here, you will need to have different sensor configuration, different methods for the, you know, the localization perception. Now, uh, more recently, especially after 2012, right, when we have CNN and those uh, uh, deep learning network here, we imagine. So we also see that, uh, you know, uh, so-called the end-to-end -end kind of localization and decision making, meaning that, uh, you know, the, the input is the sensor data and output here uh, will just be the location or the output here is just the decision of the robot and so on. Okay, so this kind of the so-called deep learning pipeline here, uh, of course, is easier to implement. And partly because nowadays we, we have a very powerful computer, right, CPU. And also we have a lot of data set uh, available, uh, big data, uh, big data set available to change our system here so that uh, we, the system here will have certain uh, uh, desirable performance. But the challenge here is, um, you know, we have a so-called generalization issue, meaning that the system chain 
from one data set here may not be generalized very well to another data set, right? So that is uh, well known in uh, in the deep learning. And that's why a lot of study now also um, focused on transfer learning and so on, right? And uh, the accuracy is also not very high, right? But uh, we do see uh, more and more um, or so-called end-to-end or part of the module replaced by a deep neural network to achieve um, better localization. And one thing we can see that, uh, you know, the deep neural network here, together with the camera, you can have uh, uh, not just the geometric understanding, but also understanding the semantic object, what are the object in the surrounding environment, right? And so, so that uh, come to more recent development uh, on so-called semantic frame and so on. Right? Um, in terms of localization system here, we know we have a few different um, systems. Uh, first one is so-called angle-based localization, right? like uh, you know GPS, and in the indoor environment, like a motion capture system, uh, Wi-Fi, also wide bank. Uh, if the, the thing here is you, you you need to install the infrastructure, for example, the beacon uh, in the environment, and use the big the information between the beacon and the robot here, then you to do do the localization and so on. Okay, so the those kind of system here, of course, the installation of the in, in infrastructure cost is one issue. The other thing, issue is, uh, you know, that the, the limited range, right? Because you have to install uh, the camera in the environment uh, and so that you can use the camera to do the checking. If you don't have, then you go somewhere be, beyond the system can reach, then you, in this case, you cannot do the localization. And the other more flexible localization system here is so-called onboard localization. You use camera, uh, LiDAR, and also IMU, right? Um, in, you know, uh, to do the localization. And of course, this uh, system here will be more flexible and can be, you know, the use for any lost place. But then we also know that onboard localization has a limitation of the shifting right? uh, with the time goes on. So that, therefore, there are also some work here on the so-called hybrid uh, fusion, meaning that onboard the uh, system uh, and uh, all together with some beacon um, be embedded in the environment, and uh, you can use the beacon measurement here to collect the drifting to achieve a more reliable, accurate localization. Okay, so let's move on to so called the multi-modality sensor fusion. Um, as I mentioned that, um, just now that the robot operating environment typically uh, can be very complicated. Uh, if for example, you have a lighting change, weather change, and uh, some environment are very dynamic, there are people moving around, and some environment here, maybe you know you have a very limited uh, feature available, for example, open space, right? And some environment could have a reflective surface and so on, right? And uh, each of the robot here, they have uh, limitation in terms of resources, like uh, computing resource, payload, communication resources, and so on. And also, you we have a cost limitation, right? We don't want to have a robot which you know can do everything, but uh, very expensive. So over here, we know there's no one size fit all solution. Right? So we got to you depend on the application, depend on the environment, depend on the accuracy and the scalability, and so on to select the sensor configuration and do the proper uh, sensor fusion. Right? So for detail in our paper here, we give a very comprehensive the surveys on the system and algo for the many system. Now let's take a look at the localization method, uh, uh, current lo localization method here. We know we have a LiDAR and we have a vision based method here, right? And of course also have a LiDAR together with the IMU and also vision together with IMU. And some also integrate the LiDAR together with the vision. Um, for LiDAR-based algo here, they can work very well in the structure uh, environment, uh, indoor structure environment. Uh, and then for the vision here, the, you can work in both indoor and outdoor, but then not need to be in the ideal lighting condition. Uh, if you have a adverse lighting condition here, then the system here may be uh, severely, performance may be severely degraded. So the, the problem with uh, those system here is the drifting. As you can see here, the map built uh, by the LiDAR here, you can see this, uh, the drift here, the load, and uh, with the data part here, this part here, load here, and do not uh, connect very well. 
And so they, there's a drifting issue here for the load system. Now for localization, as I mentioned, we have onboard localization system and uh, have a you know, anchor-based localization system here. And we, in the past year, we used quite a lot on the offshore wide bank. So this uh, is uh, anchor-based localization. So we know onboard localization using camera and LiDAR, as I just mentioned here, is accuracy is really depend on the environment, right? Whether the environment you have sufficient features or whether the lighting here is favorable or not, for example. And uh, the problem here is the shifting. Right? For example, the map built here, as you can see, with the time goes on, you know, the, 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 there's a the shifting here getting and larger and larger, right? But for onboard uh, angle-based localization, for example, using also all wide band, the good point here is you can have a very good accuracy. Right? Typically, you know, you can achieve centimeter level of accuracy. Uh, for example, in this uh, system we have developed it for one industry here to use the also wide band node here, right? To uh, localize a zone. And the zone here, you will carry a camera to inspect the surface of the aircraft, right? To make uh, to, to detect whether there is any defect on the surface and so on. So this kind of system will require a very high accuracy to make sure that uh, you know, the camera will cover every corners of the surface. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem here, of course, is the setup of this, uh, you know, uh, the, the angle here. Right? You need to have a good coverage and also the different configuration of this setup here uh, will result in different uh, you know, accuracy. Uh, so in order to get best out of it, we need to spend time to do the calibration of this angle. So um, there's a cost here in terms of calibration. Uh, now, if we're going now use onboard and together add some node here in the environment, and in this case, we can actually achieve the uh, advantage of flexibility and also achieve um, more reliable, less shift kind of estimation because we can use the measurement, absolute measurement of the angle here to eliminate or minimize the shift. Right? Okay, so, and we know for the multiple sensor system here, in terms of fusion here, you typically have two approach. One is so-called loosely coupled solution. And the so-called loosely coupled solution is that uh, you use each of the type of sensor output here. You can, based on the, each sensor output here to estimate, for example, the low position, then, um, the estimate from different sensor, you can now, you can fuse them together, right? The so-called uh, tidally coupled solution is that uh, you actually combine the low data from very, or low data or some process data from the sensor, for all the sensor, and then you do optimization to uh, estimate the, the pose of the robot. Okay, so uh, for loosely coupled solution here, uh, the, you know, you can achieve a faster speed, but the accuracy is not, well, not, may not be high, but for tidally coupled solution here, the accuracy can be higher and can have a better robustness. Now in the, our um, past few year work here, we actually developed a so-called VIDA uh, fusion. This name here is not, the, sound, does not sound very good here like virus, um, but anyway, it is developed around the time of the COVID. Uh, so essentially here is a visual initial ranging data. Uh, basically, we develop a framework here to fuse all those sensor output together. Uh, so it's a very comprehensive general framework. Now, looking at the, the picture here on the left-hand side here, you can see for the outer wide band node embedded in the environment here, we have the capability of doing the self localization. And this will save the, um, the, you know, the, the uh, sensor placement and uh, installation of, uh, cost here. And also the, you, we have the capability of check whether the, those outer wide band output here, you know, is outlined or not, right? So for outline we will reject. Right? For, if not outline, then we go to the optimization. And then IMU here, we, can, we need to do synchronization and pre-integration, and then you can uh, have the, the, the output here go into the optimization. And similarly for pine cloud here, you do feature extraction, matching, and so on, then you go into the optimization. And image, you do the same thing, like uh, synchronization, feature extraction, and also matching, marginalization, and so on. Then you do the uh, optimization, combine optimization to generate the pose of the robot. 
And uh, this optimization here, we use a, you know, the sliding window based approach. Uh, and also we use the graph optimization. Later on, I give, uh, will give a, a brief introduction about that. And for detail of this work here, you can find it from the transaction of robotic and also our patent. Now, the advantage of this system here is, um, you know, we can be very general and comprehensive. I mean, you can deduct your, the sensor you want, and then you use this uh, fusion to, uh, you know, to, to estimate the location. And it is a, a high, highly coupled approach, so can achieve a better accuracy. And we also use the map uh, matching marginalization for feature checking and the loop closure um, and refinement we based on uh, two stage point cloud alignment to, so that we can have a better, more reliable loop closure. And because of the, uh, also wide band in the environment so that we can estimate, eliminate the, the drift and so on, right? So, uh, so called the, you know, the optimization here is graph based optimization. Let me just briefly mention about that. For graph based optimization, essentially, let's say the robot, you know, you, the trajectory here starts from time k until time k plus m, right? So within this time interval here, you, of course, receive many uh, measurements from the sensor, right? From the sensor, okay? And uh, this measurement from the sensor. Uh, to, to will be used to estimate the robot pose at different time instant. Right? So this uh, interval from K to K plus M is a moving window, right? moving window. So we got to estimate the position, orientation, speed, and acceleration, and also the bias estimate uh, for the gyro and so on. And for length, you know, based on the measurement, for example, from the offset wide bank, we, and also the prediction here, we generate the residue, right? And based on the, uh, covalent here and together with the residue, we form a cost over the interval, right, over the interval. For the other sensor, it's the same, IMU and LiDAR and also feature, you do the same, right? So you form a cost here and then you minimize the cost. So we, we say graph based optimization, you can see intensity here, this is, uh, you know, there's a node here which is at each time instant here, the robot pulse, right? And then you have a measurement here, which is an H, right? It's an H, so it's a form a graph. Um, and uh, so the optimization here can be carried out by, you know, like uh, Robin Beck, uh, McCoy or other, you know, SDP semi-definite programming and method and so on. Now, let me just demonstrate to you that, uh, you know, the, the advantage of using one single node here to collect the GIF. Uh, I, just, I, will, I will go through quickly. So we compared, this is uh, in Chiboy's corridor, which is about 160, um, meter long, and uh, you know, in the corridor here, not, not many features available, right? And we use the one anchor in one end of the uh, the corridor here to so that you can range uh, do the ranging between the robot and uh, this anchor here. And then on board here, we have a monocular camera. So if you compare with the the method here with the anchor and also the very well known method like twin fusion. Like uh, VI slam here, which they all implement loop closure, we can find out that uh, you know the the um, with the anchor to the collection here, you know throughout the entire journey, right? Uh, robot uh, of the journey here, you can see there's no drift happen, but uh, for the other method here, uh, you will find that the drift will be getting larger after the robot is operating for some period of time. So the fringe model can still perform very well at the beginning. And, but after closing to the end here, you can find there's also some drift. Yeah, you can see some drift here, but uh, you know, anchor based optimization here, you know drift. Okay, so um, with that now, I will move to talk about the application of this uh, viral to some uh, uh, like a uh, structure-based inspection, talking and AGV. Right? For the structure inspection, you know that there are many structures need to be inspected. Right? And typically, uh, you know, nowadays it's still done manually and right? that is uh, quite costly and also can be hazardous for the human operator and so on, right? So you can have different kinds of the inspection like aircraft, building, bridge, crane, tunnel and inspection. The market is quite big, uh, 200, about 210 billion US. 
And uh, the environment is typically is challenging uh, because you don't, you usually you have a DBS uh, block case and the uh, referral service, like the building here, and also the lighting, you know, um, condition, lighting change and limited feature because when you fly high here, you know, you don't have a many feature in the, in the surrounding environment. And so, so some of them also have a very loosely hanging object here, which make the obstacle avoidance challenging. Uh, in our system here, we actually deploy, um, you know, the LIDAR, two LIDAR, one is horizontal, the other one is uh, downwards. And uh, this will need to use the ground feature here to complement. And also this downward can uh, measure the height of the UAV more accurately. And uh, we have also used the uh, stereo, right? So, and also IMU, four IMU for redundancy. The whole system here, you can see is a sensor. You use a sensor like stereo to do obstacle detection. With the sensor output here, you do localization and build a map and you do the path running and navigation control right? and so on, right? So this um, pipeline here is similar to uh, for every robotic system. So in this uh, GPS benign environment here, uh, for inspection, we need to have a very high accuracy. Typically, you are require sub-meter accuracy. Uh, and uh, you know, even GPS available in such an environment here, the, typically the accuracy is very poor, right? So uh, we use our system here, we can achieve um, sub-meter sub kind of accuracy, typically about 30 cm kind of accuracy in both outdoor and indoor, and also in the environment where if you have a strong wind and raining and so on. Um, uh, and also we can uh, imp we implement the system for the uh, structure in inspection, like a crane inspection, which is a, a very tall crane, about 140 meter. And uh, you, you can also achieve quite reliable um, localization using the, the, the system. And uh, this system here, of course, can also be extended to other applications like, uh, you know, using the onboard sensor to do the um, aircraft inspection. And uh, because in aircraft here, you have a rounded surface. So in this case, you need to get, have a different feature for the representation for, the, for this uh, surface. And uh, you also have a confined environment with, uh, you know, a dark lighting. And uh, so and also a surface, also urban transport and so on. Right? So this fusion here, we use uh, you know, the so-called graph optimization to carry out the, the fusion. Now, uh, some of the fusion method here, we use the filter base, for example, particle filter base, carbon filter base. Right? And here we talk, use the onboard system together with auto wide bank for achieving the dogging, a precise, efficient dogging. A dogging problem, as you see, is to navigate low body here to uh, some de desired location, for example, to navigate UAB, to the um, you know uh, rooftop of the car or navigate UAV to uh, the, the boat here to do charging or the other right. So um, typically you may use the downward camera, but you need to search where to dock or where to line it right. But that one that is not that efficient. So what we have done is we can mount it one uh, also wide bank on the UAV and another one on the dogging the vehicle here so that we can range between them right. So you, you can range between them okay at a different time instant, K minus one, K minus two and so on, right? And also the uh, the displacement, right? Displacement, we can use the IMU, uh, also optical flow, or if you want to be more accurate, use onboard sensor to carry out a slime here to work out a displacement. So with the displacement together with the uh, distance measurement here, we then trying to estimate the relative position and then navigate the, the, the UAV to the dogging place using a very simple control law. Okay, so we use so called the, uh, this is the fusion estimator. We use the measurement of the distance together with the displacement, right? And, um, but one thing we need to keep in mind that if you just, you know, move the robot here, just, you know, you don't know the position here, but then if you just move according to the proportional control, the move straight line here, then, you know, with the, you can only collect error along the, this straight line. So typically you will have a larger deviation. So what we need to do is we need to make the robot here to actually move around a bit, move around a bit, so that uh, in the theoretical we know that basically corresponding to some of the persistent uh, excitation signal in the system here, right? So the system here using the ranging, using the displacement, and if you contract the fusion estimator using adaptive method here, 
then to estimate the relative position, then you can uh, do the control uh, to navigate the, the, the robot. And uh, if you remember here, the demonstration here, you want to navigate robot to the moving platform, right? Uh, so the, you can use our method here to, to navigate robot move towards the moving platform. And uh, this figure here is basically, you have a UAV which is to carry out certain mission, uh, a certain mission, and then, uh, once they, you know, finish the mission, you know, during the mis uh, mission here, you have a GPS because you fly very high. But then when you come back here in the environment next to the building here, you will not have it available GPS or GPS is not good enough. But then we can switch to the, the our dogging system here to navigate robot to uh, the small dogging place, which here is about 1.5 to 1.5 uh, dogging place. Okay, so this is about the UAV, and uh, we can also extend uh, to the ground robot application. And what we have done in the past uh, few years is for the AGV in the manufacturing environment. Um, and uh, we know we also have a set of the uh, sensor available. It could be 2D LiDAR, could be 3D LiDAR, or RGBD camera, and so on, right? So for different the AGV here, you may need to select a different sensor. So we need to have a flexible uh, fusion system here so that uh, you know, the, 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 the system can be adapted to different uh, application or different AGV here. So we actually have a modular structure of the hardware and then also a flexible structure of software. Right? And of course the same uh, task here you need to carry out, you need to do the perception and do the path running and motion control which is very important because in the indoor environment typically is very, uh, you have a very confined environment and require very high accuracy of the checking. And then in the indoor environment, you also need to do uh, relocalization, re uh, meaning if the robot is surrounded by many people walking around here, the robot may lose the position, right? But then in this case, the robot need to relocalize itself and uh, how to have a more efficient relocalization. And then the, in the logistic application, docking is, and also the charging here is very, very important. So how to achieve very fast and precise logging, and of course uh, fleet management, and also combined together with the manipulator to achieve uh, mobile manipulation. Um, the same thing, the whole structure of the perception, localization, and uh, control uh, is similar. Uh, similar, and uh, same you can see here is use a sensor to sense the environment. Then you check the feature, uh, check the feature, and then you do the mapping here. To, Typically, we use a grid map for 2D and then the octo map here, 3D, right? So that we know this map here, basically, you will uh, represent, you know, which grid here is occupied by obstacle, which is a free space you can navigate through and so on, right? Then you can plan the path and so on. Um, so it's quite similar. I, I don't like to uh, go through the detail. Let me just show a one video to you uh, on what we have. We have We're developed a universal navigation uh, system that can be applied to various mobile platforms, which we call TruePath Kit. The screen shows the detailed internal structure of TruePath Kit. We integrate information from various sensors, for example, LIDAR, IMU, cameras, etc., to locate the robot, detect obstacles in the surrounding environment, and plan the shortest path. Our innovation, the use of vision and 3D point cloud algorithm technology to realize intelligent control algorithms allows robots to undertake complex tasks. We have implemented intelligent material handling navigation functions on different vehicles, including towing robot, logistics robot, service robot. Shown on the screen are four different navigation and path planning core technologies. We have developed a fleet management system for operating multiple mobile robot platforms. Demonstrated on the screen are three mobile robots performing different tasks using fleet management software. However, we have applied the navigation kit to different scenarios. 
The screen demonstrates that the mobile robot integrates the manipulator to grip and place PCB materials using VisionAid technology. This scenario is to demonstrate the cooperative material handling process. So, okay. So uh, the other challenging problem is uh, the dogging. For, for example, in the manufacturing environment here, this robot here is moving certain uh, component, and they need to be transported to a machine station. But uh, you need to dock. You know, uh, to this machine station very accurately so that uh, the conveyor can be connected and then to transport the, the goods and so on. Now, in, in the warehouse environment, typically, you know, it's very complicated. You have many, all kinds of different things, right? For example, uh, you know, you have box, you have, uh, you know, pallet, and you all have the machine, you know, all kinds of objects in the environment. So you will need to detect where to dock. Uh, where to dock using, for example, use the uh, port lift here to detect where is the pallet, and then you position it, and then to navigate your uh, AGV to so that you can dock with this uh, pallet and so on. So this is a, a machine learning problem here, and we have actually worked on that to using the Euro network here to uh, to to do the learn uh, learning training uh, using the local data set and so on, right? So uh, and the other thing here is uh, you know the positioning using for example, 2D LiDAR to detect where the pallet, and then you need to do the path running for this port lead here so that uh, you know you can have a good dogging. And uh, dogging here, we have a so-called face-to-face dogging, which is what we call perpendicular dogging. And then also, we also have a so-called side dogging, just like just now, uh, you know, when you want to dot the uh, AGV to the machine station here, you need to make them parallel, right? So this we call side dogging. And so, Side docking, they are quite challenging because you see, when you use the LiDAR here to detect the object, there may be other objects which look similar, right? And first thing, secondly, you know, the LiDAR point cloud here will be changing when the HV moving from different angles towards the machine staging and so on, right? So in this case, you know, how to use these, those data uh, you collect throughout the path here to estimate the location and then do the docking is a very challenging issue. And, uh, you know, some place here we need to recognize because, for example, this is a charging and then the box here look like similar, look similar to this charging station. So you got to uh, find them and then find, detect them and find to match them so that you get the correct logging. And in the warehouse environment, you also need to search, you know, where they are, right? Because, for example, if you want to list AGV here to go in to do the charging here, you need to come roughly, you know where they are, but then you come here, you need to search, you know, and then find where they are. So we, we use the LiDAR to detect the similar shape and then uh, move the AGV closer, then use the camera to do the matching, right? To find the correct the object for dogging and so on. And uh, for this one here, you know, the side dogging here, you, 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 you sometimes yeah, they are also people moving around between the AGV and dogging station. So this you also need to take consideration to make so that uh, you have dogging here can be very reliably achieved and so on. Okay, so um, with that, I want to talk a little bit on some of the work we are doing or future work. Um, one thing we know, I mean, it is well known that uh, most of the current uh, SLAM simultaneous localization and mapping, they all assume the static thing or the thing is static over a short period of time, right? But uh, it is in, inevitable that the, you know, the environment will change, they will be moving objects. So, so if you have a moving object in the surrounding environment here, then you can severely affect for your localization performance. For example, this part here, at least uh, environment in the uh, nearby Chibo E here, if you don't have a bus moving around here, we could uh, you know, achieve about one meter, around one meter kind of accuracy when the, the robot running about 1.2 kilometer. But then if you have a bus you know, moving around here, then the deviation here 
could go to 30, 30 meters, right? So in this case, this uh, dynamic object can severely affect the localization performance. So we need to consider the this, uh, localization and mapping slam in a dynamic and uh, also some uh, repetitive environment. So in a dynamic environment, some dynamic uh, object here is, we can call it highly dynamic. For example, you have moving cars and human. And typically what we can do is identify them and uh, treat them as outlier, outlier and by trying to remove the corresponding measurement associated with this uh, very dynamic object. And we also have uh, some slow dynamic object, for example, in a car park, right? in a car park here, you know, the car, model car will, you know, stay there for maybe two hours or even uh, throughout the, the morning and afternoon, right? Very long time. And uh, so in this case, if you, if you can't remove all of them, if you remove all of them, you may not have, a, you know, a lot of features available for localization and so on. So in this case, we got to identify uh, object with different, different level of dynamic and then build it. Uh, helical kind of the map. One, one is a purely static or semi-static or and, and then it's highly dynamic kind of the object and so on. Right? The other thing here is so-called the long-term slam because you know most of the demo this day you can see here, you know, basically localizing operation of robot over a short period of time. And uh, in reality here we expect robot here, you know, to operate uh, in, in an environment over a very long period of time, for example, the service robot, right? And, and we know that, uh, you know, over a longer period of time here, the environment change here, definitely you cannot avoid, right? So we need to take into consideration of the evolution of the environment, and the environment could have a new object which you do not know or you have not learned it before to come to uh, appear, right? And the other problem here is with the operation time here goes on and on here, you know, the sensor performance could uh, be degraded. Right? So in this case, how to also take into consideration of degraded sensor performance. Uh, this is uh, uh, also a challenging issue. And, um, and then also the you know, weather condition, which you know, this uh, in the uh, self-driving car here, um, this could be uh, some factor which can cause catastrophic, uh, you know, the consequences um, because the, this, uh, our sensor will perform poorly in a very, very severe or very, very um, adverse environment like, uh, you know, the, the heavy rain and so on. Right? So these are issue. So typically nowadays we have, can have a different approach, for example, geometric approach to identify the moving object you know, or you use a semantic approach, use the learning based approach here to know whether moving object here, um, something moving here, is it human or is it AGV and so on, then you remove it. Right? So you can see, if I don't remove it, then the localization, it, it, it will be degraded, uh, which is, uh, you know, the, 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 um, uh, the, 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 the yellow one here, but the, when you remove them, then you can achieve a better localization, the green one, which is very close to the ground switch, red one, right? Okay, so how do you use a deep network here to understand the, the environment, right? not just collect the point cloud geometric feature, but also comment, uh, understand the, 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 uh, the object, the meaning, and maybe some language also, uh, road size here in the environment and integrate them together with your mapping, with your map, uh, so that achieve more intelligent uh, navigation, localization. I think this is a, a lot of work here now moving towards uh, this direction. So with this, I will, conclude my talk here and uh, thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I'd like also to thank my um, postdoc and uh, PhD student <coughs> and those work here uh, were carried out by them. Uh, and uh, so I, I thank them for, for the contribution to the uh, development of the robotic technology in, in our lab. Thank you very much. <laughs>